Hi guys. This one's called Little G with Little D. And what am I talking about? The adversary, the deceiver, the liar, the father of all lies. Um, people call him Satan, Lucifer, Hassan, the deceiver of man. So, is this entity, creature, person, man a spirit? Yeah. Has he been given authority over the earth? Yes. Did God first give it to us? Absolutely. He created the heavens and earth and he created man. And what did he tell man to do? Tend my garden. You know, take care of everything. And Adam named every single creature. Uh, that's a pretty big job. And in the beginning, God walked and talked with Adam in the Garden of Eden. Life was good. But Satan couldn't let a good thing go, so he tempted. How did he tempt? Well, God put in two trees. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of the knowledge of you know, of good and evil. So you have the tree of life. Eat that fruit, you live forever. Eat the other fruit, you'll die. Now, was God lying? No, he wasn't. Because not only did you spiritually die, physically died. Why do you say that? Well, if he created Adam, which he did, and he was perfect, because God is perfect and he creates perfect things, then if he ate from the fruit of the tree of life, he'd live forever. So God said, here you go. Everything, all the trees, all the fruits, all the berries, everything else you can eat. Just don't eat this one tree. That was a rule. And we failed. Or more like Adam failed, but, you know, we're all under the same curse. So, what was sin? Disobeying God. He didn't have to eat the fruit. But it wasn't him in the initial, it was Eve. But then, you know, did Eve know better? No, they were innocent. Because they hadn't eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So they didn't know good and they didn't know evil. They just knew what they knew. It's like a little kid. I'm innocent. You know, I don't know if I should touch the stove or not. I think I want to touch the stove. I'll touch the stove. I got burned. That wasn't good. Okay, now if their parents say, hey, don't touch the stove. You're going to burn yourself. And you were told knowledge is responsibility. Now, if you touch the stove, you got burnt. It's there. It's your own fault. You were told not to do it. So, Satan, you know, the serpent, and this is in Genesis chapter 3. It says, now the serpent was more subtle than all the wild beasts that the Lord God had made. And the serpent said to the woman, first off, I'm like, okay, so this is a subtle, meaning he didn't come directly at you. He kind of came around the back door, around the side, and you didn't even notice that he was there. Subtlety. That's how Satan works. Little sin like a potato chip. Can't eat just one, right? Well, don't open the bag of potato chips and you won't be tempted. So what did he say to the woman? Now, this is talking serpent. Right off the bat, that's like kind of weird. Uh, but there's also been a talking donkey, you know, in the Bible. So nothing is impossible for God. And what's to say that Satan, which is a spirit, possessed the, the serpent? Or he wasn't the serpent in and of itself. Because he's referred to as the great dragon, the serpent, the deceiver, whatever else. So maybe he is reptilian. Don't know. But I do know that evil spirits can possess people. Just as the Holy Spirit. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit. So there is room in your body, your temple, 
for the Holy of Holies for God to live inside of you. Or you can open up portals or doors by sin or doing things and allowing it in. Um, Satan is called the prince of the power of air. What is the power of air? Well, we use radio waves, microwaves, frequencies. Um, music. It uses a diaphragm to push air. And your inner ear has a bone in there that vibrates, translating it into electrical signal that goes to your brain. Your brain goes, oh, I'm hearing music. Or someone's talking to me. Right now, you are hearing my voice through a speaker. And I'm talking in a microphone, which is translating it into a frequency. So he is the prince of the power of air. When you're watching TV, light is a frequency. It's a wavelength. I won't go into the science of it, but everything seems to operate on uh, a frequency. So, since he is the power of the air, he has control of the media, of all the things that affect your senses. What you see, what you smell, what you taste, you know, what you hear, what you feel. This is all part of the flesh. And God says, hey, follow the Spirit. And what is God? He is the Spirit. And is there more than one dimension? There's many. I mean, we can see, taste, smell, hear, feel. You know, uh, scientists have discovered other dimensions, and they're working on the quantum level, which is a totally different function. The deeper they go, the more they look, the more they're just scratching the surface of the knowledge of God. Um so we'll get back to here. So what did Satan say in chapter 3 of Genesis? Verse 1, Truly God said that you shall not eat of any fruit, any of the tree of the garden of knowledge, or you shall not eat of any tree of the garden. So here's Satan being subtle, right? He's going, so God said you can't eat any of the fruit in the garden? Well, he knew. Now, her being innocent, not knowing good or evil. And then the woman said to the serpent, we may eat all the fruit of the trees of the garden. See, God's provided in his abundance. Here's all the fruit. Here's all the trees. Eat of everything. He even offered the tree of, of eternal life. But before they got there, here's Satan jumping in, trying to screw up God's plan. So what does it say in verse 3? But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. In the midst. Okay, I've talked about that before and I've shown it. In the midst is in the middle. So these two trees are in the middle. All around it are all the other trees and everything else. So it's in the midst. And God said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. So not even just eating it, but even just touching it. Coming in the proximity and having contact which is like, this is how God sees sin. Um, it's Pride Month. Yay for everybody else. No. Boo. Okay? Because you should not even come into contact. You shouldn't even touch sin. Because a little leaven leavens the whole loaf. One rotten apple spoils a bunch. So you can't just say, uh, it's okay, you know, God is all about love. And he is. But... That doesn't mean, okay, it's all right to sin and be disobedient. That's like saying, hey, Eve, go over and eat the fruit, and God still, he cares about you, he loves you. Which he's a loving father. But he can't tolerate the sin, the disobedience, the evil, the corruption. And so the serpent said, because she is repeating what God said, says, you know, don't touch it lest you die. So God says, if you touch it, if you eat from it, you will die. And the Satan, Satan said to the woman, You shall not surely die. Right there. Lying, deceitful, saying, And what is he doing? He's calling God a liar. Now what does it say in the Bible? Let all men be a liar, but God be true. Because he doesn't lie. So everything in the Bible that God says is the truth. So in verse 5, Chapter 3, for God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes shall be open and you shall be like gods. Gods, plural, with a little g. 
okay? Knowing good and evil. So hey, you're going to be like us, right? So the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and that the tree look was and the tree was delightful to look at. Okay? Right there. So she went over to the tree and she looked at it and saw that it was good for food. So she thought about it. Okay, she looked at the tree, said it was pleasant to the eyes. So she was looking at it. Okay. And it was delightful. So she was like, hey, this is nice, right? So that little bit of sin just kind of creeped in. Why? Because she looked at it. Because she said, hey, it's delightful to look at. Hey, look, it's good for food. All these rationales, why it's okay. Even though God said don't. The same with any other sin in your life. And how does God um, deal with this? Well, he'll deal, he deals with it later with his son. But what does Satan do? First he calls God a liar. Then he goes, hey, take a look at the tree, you know, look, it's good to eat, and look, it's pleasant to your, you know, to your eyes, right? He's manipulating the senses of Eve, you know, and she took the fruit thereof. She went and grabbed the fruit, which God said, don't touch it. Don't even look at it. Don't even touch it. Here's Satan telling her, look at it, touch it. Come on, you know, you want it, right? And what did she do? and did eat, and also gave it to her husband with her, and he did eat. So not only did she eat it, and had and obtain the knowledge of good and evil, so now she knew what it meant, and she offered it to her husband, knowing that he would end up sinning and disobeying God. Then the eyes, and this is verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened, so does that mean the eyes were closed before? Spiritually, yes. And they didn't know good or evil. Didn't know either one. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Okay, so now their eyes were open. They realized, oh no, I'm naked. Right? I got no clothes on. Well, how would they know that? Which means before they ate the fruit, they were walking around with no clothes on, going, da, 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 this is the way God made us, must be okay, right? I don't need to cover because I'm not ashamed of any sin or my nakedness. But when they ate the fruit, they realized, I'm naked, I need to cover up. Cover up what? Cover up the sin of eating the fruit. And what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves an apron. Why? Because they were ashamed. They wanted to cover it up. Now, it goes on, talks about, hey, God says, where are you guys? And he's walking in the garden in the cool of the day, you know, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God. Now, here's God walking in the garden, and they were there. But they were hid themselves. Why? Because they were ashamed what they did. They knew they had disobeyed. They knew that they deserved to be punished for disobedience. This is sin. So, our adversary, our enemy, is Lucifer, Satan, the devil, the serpent, okay? Because he tempts with what? Teasing your eyes, your ears, your senses, and going, hey, the whole world, everything, you know, just go ahead. Right? Knowing that your eternal soul is damned forever by disobedience. So, that was just tempting to people. Let's go down to Genesis chapter 11. Now, the whole earth spoke one language and one manner of speech. So, there are one people speaking one language and one manner of speech. And what? They said to themselves, hey, let's put together bricks and mortars, build a city. This is Babylon, right? Babel on, right? So to keep speaking and babbling and Babylon, and that's where this comes from, and the Tower of Babel, right? 
Why? Because what does babble mean? You know, blah, 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 you know, make no sense, but just keep talking. So in verse chapter 11, verse 4 of Genesis, then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top may reach to heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. So they're all in one place. They want to make a big city. They want to make a tower to go up to heaven. And they want to make a name for themselves. They wanted to be like God. They wanted to be better than God. What did God do? He confused their language and scattered them abroad, which is why we have all the different nations, the races, the colors of skins, and the languages. So this is the first time that man tried to overthrow God. And of course, if you read this, it says the whole earth spoke one language and one manner of speech. In Revelations, they'll be of one mind, one body, one man, mind, one thought. This I see as 5G and controlling the mind, which they can already do, uh, using computers and artificial intelligence. They have vitamins you can take that can uh, turn your whole body into a electronic device. Because we are a bioelectrical system, you know, your heart beats without you thinking. Uh, but you'll be able to, with a tattoo on your hand or whatever else, you'll be able to control devices through your mind, through your body. And I think it'll be a bi-directional. It won't be just the, oh, I can just affect things, you know, and they have these programs where people with physical limitations, paraplegics, they can use their mind to connect to a computer and control things. Well, what's to say they don't go the other way and go in the back door into your head, right? So, that was the first time all of humanity tried to uh, overthrow God and undermine God's authority. Now, in Isaiah, chapter 11, or chapter 14, verse 11, it talks about our adversary. It says, your pride has brought you down to Sheol. Sheol is a um, Jewish name for hell. The noise of your harp is dead, the dust of your the dust is spread under you, and the worms cover you. How are, are you fallen from heaven? Howling in the morning. There's another translation. That says, How have you come to fall from the heavens, morning star, son of the dawn? How, have you been, how did you come to be cut down to the ground, conquering the nations? So, who is this? Lucifer. Okay. Where did he fall from? Heaven. Has he been kicked out of heaven? Uh, it's coming soon. There's a battle going on. And Michael will stand up for the saints and for the church and kick Satan out of heaven. And he's going to come here and he's going to be really upset. And that's Revelation 12, where the child you know, is born from the woman and the woman is taken into the wilderness of safety and the child is taken up to heaven. And then Satan goes to war with the saints. That's in Revelation. Um, but in chapter 14 of Isaiah, verse 13, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will dwell also upon the high mountain in the outer regions of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. From henceforth you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the bottom of the pit. This is what God is saying. He's like, Lucifer is saying, I'm going to be better than you. I'm going to be, you know, he's, he's boasting. He's proudful. And that was his sin. You know, he was second into command. Uh, I think he was in charge of the music and all the angels. He was an archangel. Um, and here he is thinking, I'm going to be better than God. How can you be better than the creator when you're the creation? And so God says, you know, I will bring you down to hell and to the bottomless pit. So what happens in Revelation? Sorry about it, I got a plane going over. Um, in Revelations, 18, 19, I think it is. Don't quote me on the number. 
but uh, he, you know, he is bound by chains and thrown in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. But before that, Abaddon, he is released from the bottomless pit to make war with the saints, to create problems, to have issues. You know, yeah, that's where locusts come from. But after the thousand years he's thrown in the pit, he's released again to show that only God can save us and not our doing. Even if all evil and everything is taken away, you know, there's still going to be a rebellion. And Satan's going to tempt them again. Okay? But here in verse 15, chapter 14 of Isaiah, Isaiah 14, verse 15, From hence you shall be brought down to Sheol to the bottom of the pit. Those who see you shall stare at you and consider, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble and who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not free his prisoners? So what's going to happen? Satan, when he gets kicked out of earth, out of heaven, is going to be pissed off, angry. He's going to destroy the cities. He's going to destroy the world. Which makes me think of God's wrath, and he's going to be the tool being used. You know, and he thinks he's, you know, doing his own thing. No, everything happens according to the will of the Father. Good or evil. So, we don't always know. So, let's go on to Matthew chapter 4, verse 2. Or we can go to verse 1. Um, it says, Then Jesus was carried away by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. First off, I look at that and going, Jesus was carried away by the Spirit. So he's lifted up and, and taken to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So he didn't walk there. He got carried by the Holy Spirit. I'm just looking at it, right? Where? To the wilderness, where there's nothing around. Okay? So he fasted for 40 days and nights, but at last he was hungry. 40 days and 40 nights is a long time not to eat. You can survive that long if you have water. I think you can go 60 days. Water, no food. You can only last three or four days without water. Because you need water. Hmm. Just like you need the Holy Spirit. And you need the word. So, <clears throat> goes on, um, chapter 4 of Matthew, verse 3. And the tempter drew near and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. It's right there. He's like, Hey, if you're the Son of God, he was mocking him. He knew darn well that Jesus was the Son of God. Because even the demons, you know, have said, oh my gosh, it's the Son of God. You know, don't throw us out of these, this body into the abyss. You know, throw us in these pigs. Well, okay. And he said, he granted it and threw them in the pigs. And the pigs went off the cliff into the ocean and killed themselves. So they were still free spirits, not thrown into outer darkness. But, so here he is, the tempter. That's Satan, the devil. It's for, give him a name. And so he tempted Jesus said, if you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Now, first off, he says, command these stones to become bread. He knew the authority of Jesus. Jesus could turn these stones into bread if he wanted to eat. Now, when he rode in on a donkey, <clears throat> people praised him with palm leaves saying, Hoshana, Hoshana, you know, like, God saves us. And the Pharisees and Sadducees are like, oh, hey, why are they praising you? It's not, you know. He said, if they didn't, these rocks would get up and praise me. Which makes me think, hey, in heaven, does everything sing praises to God? How awesome would that be? Plants, rocks, trees, everything. It says uh, in Job's words, like, the heavens 
everything, all creatures in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, which always makes me, what's under the earth? But, you know, they all praise God. Uh, whales, their whale songs, are they praising God? I think so. You know, the stars praise them, the heavens praise them. You know, people have recorded it and you can hear the song of God everywhere because it's frequencies. Even the stars, which are considered angels, or angels are considered stars, either way, something like that. But he said, so he said to, you know, Lucifer, he's like, yeah, you know, you're tempting me to make these rocks into um, to bread. And his answer was saying, it is written that it is not by bread alone that man can live, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What is every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God? Oh, the Bible. Right? You can't live just by bread alone. No, you need water. And water is the word. Water is the spirit. So, and how did he defeat Lucifer? He said, yeah, you're tempting me, and I'm hungry, I'm starving. It's been 40 days and 40 nights. But he went to the word as a way to rebuke Satan. So then, Satan says, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 5, Then the adversary took, to him, took him to the holy city and made him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. So how did he take him from the wilderness that the Holy Spirit took him to up to the pinnacle, which is the very top of the temple, the highest point? Because Satan has powers too. Are they as great as Jesus's? Absolutely not. How did Satan get control of the earth? Because we sinned and we fell. God gave it to us to take care of, with a caretaker. When we sinned, we gave up all title and authority to the earth, and it became Lucifer's. Because he's the prince of the power of air. He is the power that controls this place where we're at now, earth. So, he is tempting. Say, Jesus did not refute that he had the authority and power over everything that's in the earth. Because it was granted to him when we gave it up. Whether knowingly or unknowingly. And Christ took it back on the cross. Christ now has authority over all things that are put underneath his feet. Which is, the earth is his footstool, so, yep, it's in his authority. But let's go on. So he took him up to the pinnacle of the temple and showed him what? And he said to him, if you are the son of God, here he is again mocking him, if you're the son of God, he knows he is. He knows he has no authority over him. Throw yourself down, for it is written that he commanded his angels concerning you, that they will bear you up on their hands, so that even your foot may not strike a stone. Really? Yeah, it says in the Old Testament. So dash your foot on a stone and the angels will bear you up. Which is true. And what did Jesus say? Now he knew. Throw himself off this pinnacle, this high area on the temple, and fall to the ground that the angels will come and rescue him. They would not let him die. Because the purpose of Father is that he was to go to the cross in order to be a propitiation, an exchange, a payment to cover the sin. Because back in Genesis, we made fig leaves of aprons to cover ourselves. God took an innocent lamb, slain it, and took the skins and covered Adam and Eve. Which is to show that the blood of an innocent lamb will cover the sins. No, and that God himself will provide a sacrifice. That's what Adam Abraham said to Isaac when they went up to Mount Moriah and, and he had, God told him to sacrifice his son. And Isaac said, where's the sacrifice? Abraham knew. He said God will provide himself a sacrifice, which is a play on words. Yes, he, there he provided a ram that was stuck in the thicket, but he was also 
foretelling that Jesus would die on the cross as an innocent lamb to shed his blood to cover our sins of all humanity, even Adam and Eve, so that it would be acceptable in the God's uh, acceptable in Father's eyes that his blood was sufficient to pay for our sin. So, is that a license to sin? Absolutely not. Should we repent from sin? Yes. Will we fall? Uh, will we stumble? Uh, we make mistakes. We're not perfect. Do we continue to sin? Does it give us a license to sin? Absolutely not. But I digress. So, what happened in Matthew chapter 4, verse 7? Jesus said to him, Again, it is written. So there he is, going back to that word. See, here's the tool that God gave us to defeat Satan. And he doesn't want us to know this word. He doesn't want us to know the truth. Because greater is the one that lives in us than is in this world. Who's in this world? Our adversary. Okay, so Lucifer knows that when we're empowered with the Holy Spirit, he's in deep, deep trouble. We can cast out demons. But not us, but the Holy Spirit using us. So he goes on and saying, It is written that you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So we're not to tempt who? The Lord. And who's the Lord? Your God. Okay. So he's saying this to Lucifer. Hey, Lucifer, you were created by God. You were created by me. And I am God. And he keeps... You know, Lucifer keeps saying, oh, well, if you're the Son of God, no, I, I am the, you know, Jesus is the Son of God and the Creator of all things. But yet, here he is. And why did God allow all this text in the Bible? Well, 40 days and 40 nights, like Noah and the flood, you know. He repeats 40 days and 40 nights a lot through the Bible. But he did this to teach us how to fight the adversary. So let's go on. In verse 8, And again, the adversary took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Okay. First off, he was on the ground going, Hey, you're hungry. Change these rocks into bread and eat. And Jesus went to the Word. No, 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 no. Right? Then he took him up to the pinnacle, the highest temple, you know, the, and said, Hey, look, throw yourself down and God will save you. Tempt God, right? Um, you may be covered by the blood. That doesn't mean that you have the right to um, tempt God to say, hey, I'm going to run out in front of a bus. God will save me. Well, that's dumb. You know, is that the will of the Father? I don't think so. So, trying to test his authority? He has all authority. You know, will he allow you to make mistakes? Do you learn from mistakes? Hopefully, you know, when everything is good, do you strive to be better? Eh, you kind of get comfortable, right? But when we're weak, he is strong. So, so now Lucifer takes him up to the highest mountain, right? The highest mountain, the highest mountain of the whole world. So there must be a mountain that's the highest peak. A lot of people say Everest. Maybe there's another mountain we haven't found. And showed them all the kingdoms, ah, sorry, no, uh, all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Now, how do you show him all the kingdoms of the world at one time on a high mountain if the world's a globe? But it's flat and he's on a high mountain, he can look down everywhere. Well, I'm just saying. Kind of not an issue here. Okay, and he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. So here he is, his pride wanting the Son of God, the Creator, to worship him. Trying, Lucifer is trying to get God to worship him. <laughs> it should be the other way around. Because every knee shall bow and say and profess that Jesus is Lord. That's in Revelation. At the very end of all this mess. So, Lucifer knows that his time is up. It's coming soon. You know. So now, he says, I'll give it all to you. 
which means he has the authority over it. He has control over it. And we are living in this world and kingdoms that Lucifer has control over. So when they say, hey, you got a American Idol on TV, you got your movie stars, your um, your rock stars, your rock idols, your um, kings and politicians and everybody else that all want to be idolized and worship and power and greed and glory. And who's in charge of them? Well, there's different levels, but at the very top, it's Lucifer. So he's controlling this world. You wonder why it's all screwed up? That's why. You know, is Jesus coming back to fix it? Yes, he is. Has, does he have authority to do that? Absolutely. Not only, not only does, is he God, but on the cross, he shed his blood and he took back possession of the world. He just hasn't come back to claim it, to get it. He's also going to set the prisoners free. And that's us. So what did Jesus say to this temptation of Lucifer? You know, to fall down and worship him, and if he does, he'll give him everything in this world, kingdom, whatever. Now, God created heaven and earth. This is just the earth, which is his footstool. He owns everything. He holds it all together by his word, by his authority, and by his power. So this is kind of like, <laughs> right, you're going to give me a Tonka truck when I own all the cars, you know, in the world. Mm, no. Okay, I own everything in everywhere. So you're going to offer me my footstool, which I created and I own, but you happen to have it by technicality um, because Adam and Eve sinned and you took control. He's a thief and a liar. So then Jesus said in chapter 4, verse 10, then Jesus said to him, get away, Satan. So now he's using his authority as God and creator and saying, you're done. I'm done with this testing. Go away. You know, and what did Satan do? He had to obey. Right? He says, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So he rebuked him from the Bible, from the word, that you will only love your God. You know, he's like, I will not bow to him. You, everyone should bow and will bow to God. Then the adversary left him alone. And behold, the angels drew near and ministered to him. So, these are the three temptations. What did he tempt him with? He was hungry. Eat. Okay? That's out of the flesh. All right? He said, hey, throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple and, you know, end up committing suicide. Kill yourself, right? You know, but also tempting God that the angels will come and save him. You know, then he said, you know, tempting him with everything in the world, everything you see. You know, it's like, I want a big house, a big car, I want this, I want that. You know, whatever the temptation is. You know, and God said in the Ten Commandments, it's like, hey, the first five is about loving God, and the second five, the last five, is about your brother. You know, don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, don't cut it, you know. But the first part is like, love your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your body, you know, and don't worship false gods. Um, Yeah. It kind of reminds me of the ten virgins, you know, and the five were wise that had the oil, which is the Holy Spirit, and the which is this oil is made from olives. Okay? But the last five were foolish. They didn't have the oil. They weren't ready. And the five last commandments are talking about the, the sins that man could... Uh, could do, but shouldn't. So then, let's go to Mark chapter 1, verse 13. So in Mark chapter 1, verse 13, And immediately the Spirit drove him out into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, being tested by Satan. 
and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. That was it. Didn't give any much details. It said, hey, this is what happened. Okay. So each gospel has a little bit different information. Um, but I saw verse 15 of chapter 1. And it said, John was delivered up. This is verse 14. Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. saying, the time has come to the end. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, John was delivered up to who? Herod. His wife wanted, or his daughter, um, both, wanted his head on a platter. So he was beheaded. I think John is kind of a analogy, a typology of the church. You know, the tribulation saints will be beheaded until the full number of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And that's... Um, I think, Revelations 5 or 6. Um, but, what did Jesus say? The time has come to an end. In Ecclesiastes, there's a, uh, there's a time for everything under heaven. And then it lists off all the different things. You know, this is the time of the end. This is where we're at. And the kingdom of God is at hand. It's about to happen. But there's a whole lot of rough stuff that's going to happen before we get to the kingdom of God. But what does Jesus say? Repent and believe in the gospel. So he's like, repent. What does that mean? Turn away from doing sin and evil and turn towards God. And do, and do what else? Believe in the gospel. Well, what's the gospel? The good news. What's the good news? That Jesus died on the cross. His blood was shed. And it's a sufficient price to pay for all of our sins. And that now we are no longer an enemy to God, but a friend, more than a friend or a servant. You know, we are sons and daughters of, of, of God. And if we're sons and daughters, we have an inheritance. And what's our inheritance? Salvation. And what's the salvation? Eternal life. And God and Jesus is coming back with his rewards. So, I'm going to jump around just a little bit. Yes. So, we're going to go to um, Luke. Chapter 3, verse 16. John answered, saying to them, Behold, I baptize you with water, but one is coming after me who is greater than I, the strings of whose shoes I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So one's a water baptism, which is what? an outward profession of an inward change in your life. And the Jews did circumcision after eight days um, on the foreskin of a man to show an outward sign that they are a Jew. And Jesus said, you know, circumcise your heart. Not just the physical body, but your heart. Peel away, you know, the sin and the evil and live in the spirit, not the flesh. So the baptism is a sign of death to the flesh and a lie to the spirit. And Jesus has another baptism of baptizing the Holy Spirit. Why do I say that? Well, Pentecost is coming up. So after Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood, was in the grave for three days, rose again, and folded the cloth that was on his head and laid it down. He came out and he was there for how long? 40 days before he ascended into heaven. So, here we are in verse 17. He holds a shovel in his hand and purifies his threshing. The wheat he gathers into his barns 
and the straw he burns in an unquenchable fire. So Jesus will baptize us in the Holy Spirit. So, after Pentecost, after 40 days, he was raised up. 10 more days makes 50 days, which is the 50 days of Omer, or the Feast of Weeks, or seven weeks. And we come to Pentecost. And what happened in Pentecost? Jesus said, hey, go to the upper room and wait. And then the Holy Spirit fell like a rushing wind, and then they spoke different languages. They were able to do all these miraculous things. But what happened when Jesus got baptized by John? The Holy Spirit fell on him like a dove, and everybody shows this dove picture, but it wasn't a dove. It was the Holy Spirit falling on him. But they saw the Holy Spirit falling on him. And then what did the voice say in heaven? This is my son in which I am well pleased. Listen to him. Right? What did Mary say when they changed the water to wine at the wedding? He, she told the servants, when they're, hey, there's no more wine, there's water. And she said, whatever he says, do what he says. Listen to him. So, for all you uh, people that worship Mary, she pointed to Jesus and said, do what he says. Which directly goes against what you guys are believing. Say, hey, you got to listen to Mary. No, you got to listen to Jesus. Okay, we'll go on. So he has a shovel in his hand. This is verse 17, right? Chapter 3, verse 17. He's got a shovel. Now, maybe it's not a shovel. I, got, I would like to check the Hebrew and the Greek to find out exactly what kind of tool. I think it may be a sickle, you know, because he's going to purify what? His threshing floor. What's the threshing floor? The earth, okay? They would throw barley or wheat or whatever up in the air in a basket, and the wind would blow away the chaff, but what remained was the barley or the wheat, the seed, because it was heavier, and it'd fall in the basket, okay? Whatever fell on the floor, you would thresh it with a broom to get the light stuff to blow up in the air, and what was left on the ground was whatever remaining seed there was, the remnant, okay? But what does he do with the wheat? He gathers it into his barn, a gathering into his barn. Kind of like a rapture, right? But what happens to the rest of it? The straw, he burns up in an unquenchable fire. The straw is the evil people that don't want to repent and come to Jesus, the saving knowledge that he's offered a way not to have to be thrown into the unquenchable fire. What's the unquenchable fire? The lake of fire. This is created for the Lucifer. That's his punishment. And all the angels that rebelled, right? What's well, rebellion? Sin. Okay, they disobeyed. But Jesus doesn't send us there. We choose to go there by rejecting his offer, a free gift of salvation. So let's go to Luke chapter 13, verse 3. And it says, no, but I say to you, because they were talking about the Galatians and how bad of sinners they were. You know, and a degree of sin, right? And is there a, a menial sin or a renal sin? Is there different levels of sin? Catholic Church says yes. God says, disobedience is disobedience. You disobey. That's just, you call it a sin, but you know what? If you break one part of the law, you've broken it all. So what was the reply that Jesus said? No, no, but I say to you that all you also, if you do not repent, will perish in the same way. And then he talks about the 18 that were, um, that a tower in uh, Shihola fell on them and killed them. And they were trying to, is there a greater sinner and a lesser sinner? They're all sinners. And we are all sinners. We all fell short of the glory of God. We can't work our way into heaven. We can't be good enough. We cannot obtain through works to be justified. Why did Jesus go on the cross? What was the point? To shed the blood. What did he say? It was finished. That's it. It's done. But what happened while he was on the cross? He's like, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? He was separated from God because he was perfect. And he was justified in his righteousness. But God laid all the sin on him. Well, in order to 
have all that sin on him, he had to be separated. Because God is perfect. Jesus was perfect. Jesus is God. So the Father and God had to be disconnected for our sake. And he took his, Father took his righteousness from Jesus and put it on us. Covering us. That's why the Passover. So that in Egypt, when you saw the blood on the doorpost, the destroyer, Abaddon or whatever, it would pass over. Right? And so then the punishment would be on the houses that have the blood of the innocent lambs on the doorposts. And we should have the blood of Jesus Christ on our doorpost of our heart. Um, but all the ones that didn't have the blood, firstborn child died. So, that's why Jesus went to the cross. So that he could take all of our sins and all the evil things we've done and put his righteousness on us. He took his white robe off, in a sense, and put his white robe on us. So when Father looks at us, he says, no, because Satan's accusing us daily, going, look, there's a sinner, look, there's a sinner, look, there's a sinner. And God says, or sees, Father says, that no, I see the white robe on him. Why? Because we're covered by his blood. Does that mean we're once saved, always saved? Uh, no, you could take the robe off. You shouldn't. You know, which is why Jesus says here again in verse 5, No, but I say to you that unless you repent, all of you will perish like them. So you will perish. So you repent. Oh, but that's worse. You're never good enough. No, you're justified by Jesus' blood. But does that give you a license to take off that robe and keep sinning? No. Is repenting works? No. It's acknowledging that I can't do it without you. And I need forgiveness. And I need your robe on me forever. So, is there a... Uh, Twisting of the word? Absolutely, Lucifer loves to twist it around. You know, are we justified by faith? You know, through grace? Grace through faith? Uh-huh. Are our names written in the book of life before the beginning of the creation? Yes. Can any of us be taken out of the hand of God? Not if God doesn't want it to happen. Many are called, but few are chosen. So let's go on. And this kind of gives an example, you know, of some of the uh, temptations from Lucifer. He tempted Christ three times. Um, in chapter 13, verse 10, while Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, it's really important. He's teaching in the Sabbath, on the Sabbath day in the synagogue. And there was a woman who had been afflicted with rheumatite, rheumatite, rheumatism, um, which affects your bones, uh, for 18 years. Why 18? I don't know. That must be important. And was bent down and could never straighten up herself at all. So she was hunched over, right? And it was a, a de degradation of the bones, I think is what it is. Um, Jesus saw the woman and called out to her and said, Woman, you are cured of your sickness. Just by his word. Because in the beginning God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Okay? And he laid his hand on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. So he called it out, and then he laid a hand on her. You know, and the Holy Spirit healed her. So she immediately straightened up. It's like, whoa, hey, I'm Okay, I can dance now. Woo! -hoo. She started praising God. You know, but the leader of the synagogue answered in anger. Where does anger come from? Right? If God is love, why is there anger? Now, does God get angry with sin? Absolutely. Does he have a wrath and he's going to punish people? Absolutely. But this was not just like anger as I see it. It was, they were upset, 
How dare you heal somebody on the Sabbath? You're breaking the law. I'm like, Jesus is like, um, I wrote the law. I am God. I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah, right? But it's not out of pride. He's like, you're telling me about what I said to tell these people to write down in the book? But I digress. So they were angry because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the people, there are six days which a man should work. And in those days you ought not to come and be healed. Oh, you ought to come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. That's what the leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were saying. Hey, you got six days to come and get healed. On the seventh day on the Sabbath, you shouldn't, mm -mm, no, you're breaking the law. Now, Jesus is coming from a love and, and mercy. He, Jesus answered saying to him, oh, you hypocrites. Like, how dare you? Right? Um, does not each one of you loosen his ox and his ass from the manger and go with it to give it a drink? It's like, you need to feed your animals. You need to water your animals. You need to take care of, you know, what God has given you. You're not supposed to work. You're supposed to rest on the Sabbath, right? That's what the Pharisees and Sadducees were saying. But Jesus was saying, it's like, Sabbath was made for us to not have to. Don't work six days. Take one off and spend it with God and praise God. He only... Ask for a tenth of tithing, right? So he's like, hey, you got six days to get work done, seventh rest, and spend it with me. I understand that. I have kids, and I'm like, hey, guys, you know, pencil me on Tuesday at 3 o'clock so we can hang out for a while, right? But they have lives, and they have things they have to do. And it's totally understandable. I see where God's coming in with this, you know. And his response in verse 16 was, this is a daughter of Abraham. He's talking, hey, she is, her genetic code, she is a daughter of Abraham. Down the lineage, somewhere, she's a Jew, you know, one of her relatives is related to Abraham. So, and behold, the adversary bound her for 18 years. And was, was it not necessary for her to be loosened from this bond on the Sabbath day? When I look at this, he's having kindness and compassion on this woman. For 18 years, she was humped over. She could not walk. She probably couldn't lift. She probably couldn't do much for herself. She needed help. And what does he say? The adversary bound her for 18 years. Spiritual bind binding that affected her body. Jesus comes to set us free to release these bonds, and to free us from the prison that we're in. Satan had this woman bound up spiritually, you know, which affected her physical body, and Jesus set her free. And it was necessary for her to be released on the Sabbath day to prove to these Pharisees and Sadducees, hey, the mercy of God is not limited to the box you put him in. Nothing is impossible for God. He allows it, he permits it, or he doesn't. Job was blessed, and he lost everything, and he was blessed twice or four times over after the, all the testing. And what do you say? God gave it to me, God can take it away. God can do as he pleases, and nobody can say no. Right? Not even Lucifer. And he knows this. So, in verse 17, he says, and when he said these things, all who opposed him were ashamed. Why? Because he told them the truth. This woman is one of their brethren, a sister. She was being punished by Lucifer in bondage. Why shouldn't she be set free? She loves God. God has mercy on her. Isn't his authority and will to... Make an example of her to be set free after 18 years. And all the people rejoiced over all the wonders which were done by his hand. And there were wonders. 
So he did more than just heal this one woman. And that was a blessing. Now I'm going to go back up to verse 7. Chapter 13, Luke, verse 7. And he said to the laborer, Behold, for three years I have been coming and seeking fruit from this fig tree. Fig tree is Israel, the Jews. You know, now, three years, a day is like a thousand years to Christ, Second Peter, something or other, right? So if I look at this going, was that three years or three thousand? But anyway. So he says, I am coming, seeking fruit from the fruit tree, and I found none. Cut it down, why should it, the ground be wasted? Now, didn't Jesus go up to a fig tree and said there was no fruit and told it, you know, no more fruit shall come from you, and it withered? And the apostles were like, oh my gosh, how did you do that? Right? Well, here it is. All right? Now, verse 8, chapter 13, verse 8. The laborer said to him, My Lord, let it remain this year also, until I work it and fertilize it. And it might bear fruit, and if not, then you can cut it down. This reminds me of what's going to happen in the future in Revelation. So, didn't Jesus say, aren't there four months till the harvest? So, the laborer, I think, is... The angels and the church and the body it's like hey let us you know spread the good news which is the fertilizer and the holy spirit and working you know to bear fruit right and if it doesn't bear fruit cut it down this is the weeds and the tares right and the tares are, are weeds that grew up with the wheat and they they look the same you know and what did he say i think this is matthew it's like let them grow up together until they're fully matured which is what? Bearing fruit. And then cut the tares down, throw them in the fire, but take the wheat and put it in the barn. We just talked about that. You know, so who is our adversary? Lucifer. What is he doing? He's running around like a roaring lion, trying to accuse everybody and to get everybody to sin. And Jesus is in heaven going, no, you know, this person has been covered by my blood. So they are technically sinless, even though we're still in this fleshly, corrupted, sin body. But there's a spiritual change, which is why we are supposed to do exactly what God commands, the great commandment of, you know, preach the gospel to the whole entire world and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So tell everybody, hey, you don't have to go to hell. You don't have to be punished forever and ever and ever. You have an opportunity. God has given to you freely. It cost him his life. But to you, it's free. So do you accept his free gift of his sacrifice to cover your blood? And then what? Stop doing your will, doing his will. Become a willing vessel. Be used by the Father. And then what do you do? You tell somebody else. And then they can get saved. And they'll tell somebody else. And it's kind of like, you know... One person gets a cold and then it spreads everywhere. And like little kids are germ factories. They go to school and they get all these diseases and they bring them home. And hey, everybody gets sick. Well, you know what? You can plant the seed in the opposite direction like love and goodness and kindness. And um, spreading the good news that there's a way not to go to hell. And you can be with God forever and ever without any more pain and suffering or war or evil or bad things. And the good stuff spirals upward and the bad stuff spirals downward. So I would say choose Jesus. Sorry this one's a little bit on the long side, but a lot of information. So repent and don't be per don't perish like the others. Love you.